Thank you all very much for coming here today. It's very exciting to have our second seminar in our rebooted DPA, Department of Pacific Affairs seminar series. And it's so good to do it face to face, though we are recording, if everyone's aware of that. Tawira Nuna, Tawira Nanawal, Yangu Narawiri, Dunamanyan, Nunawalwari, Tawira Wari. Ningada, Dindi, Tawira, Nunawalbun, Yinjuma, Raljinyin. So my name's Judy Putt. I'm in the Department of Pacific Affairs. I'm a research fellow there. I could tell you a lot about myself, but I won't. <laughs> we only have an hour. And um, I really just want to introduce our presenter today, which, who I hope most of you already know, Dr. Amanda Watson, who's also a research fellow in the Department of Pacific Affairs. Uh, she has uh, an august background, has spent many years living and teaching in Papua New Guinea and uh, has a specific interest in something that affects all of us and will continue to affect all of us in many, many ways going forward. Um, so I think it's just fantastic that we've got someone with her research interests in the department. And um, she's going to share with us today um, uh, her knowledge of this area, which I think is fascinating um, in terms of undersea. Um, cables. So I, I won't say anything more. I do encourage you to switch off your phones or put them on um, silent mode. Has everyone got a mat before we start? And um, I would ask you to hold off questioning, uh, questioning, asking questions <laughs> until Amanda's finished. Um, she should speak for what, about 40 minutes and then we'll have questions after that. Okay. Thanks, Judy. Geopolitics, cybersecurity, and sustainability are important issues with regard to information and communication technologies in the Pacific region. And this presentation will explore those three issues with a focus on undersea internet cables. The presentation will introduce the cables themselves in the Pacific region. It will highlight the promises and the hopes that people have regarding what they might gain from these cables. Uh, the presentation will then outline some ongoing research that I'm doing with partners regarding mobile internet speeds and mobile internet prices experienced by people in Pacific Island nations. And it will consider those three concepts again at the end, and there'll be time for questions, as Judy mentioned. So undersea internet cables literally means cables underneath the ocean sitting on the seabed, also called submarine cables or subsea cables. Uh, and these are the cables through which internet traffic moves. So if you have a WhatsApp call with someone in a Pacific Island nation or you send an email or you look at the website of a Pacific Island government's website, that kind of thing, uh, then that traffic might be moving through one of these cables. Um, and these cables can of course be international or also domestic. The cables are laid by ships uh, and just to mention too that I'm focusing specifically on internet cables, although telecommunication traffic such as telephone calls, international telephone calls and so on can also move through these kind of cables. So the cables are one part in a system consisting of four parts. The wet side is the actual cable itself, the part that's underneath the ocean. Then you have the beach manhole, which is where the cable emerges from the sea to the land, the point at the coast where it actually comes out. The submarine cable landing station should be right there in that spot as well. And that's where there's all the necessary equipment and a power supply to get the signal from the cable and pass it on to a terrestrial system. That system is the backhaul, that's the fourth part of the system, and it connects the circuits from the submarine cable landing station to another place, usually a telecommunication company's exchange. Uh, so that telecommunication company's exchange is the terminating point of the backhaul part of the system. So of course from that telecommunication company they can then provide voice or data 
uh, to be distributed through the smaller networks that they, they run. In some countries, it's worth mentioning that telecommunication companies are able to build their own backhaul facilities from a submarine cable landing station, whereas in some countries, the submarine cable landing station is run as an entity or kind of like a monopoly on its own. So for instance, in Singapore, various companies are able to access the submarine cable landing station, enabling enhanced competition in terms of access to that uh, data from the cable. So uh, just worth mentioning too that there are alternative technologies to cables. So satellites, for instance, and this picture here shows O3B, which is one of the satellite systems that has uh, satellites along the equator, and it offers internet access from 50 degrees north of the equator to 50 degrees south of the equator. So for instance, Digicel in Papua New Guinea has been using the O3B satellite network to provide uh, internet to their customers in Papua New Guinea. Another satellite service worth mentioning is Pacific, which is one of Asia Pacific's newest satellites. It's, uh, the company Pacific is currently setting up dishes all over Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Vanuatu and so on, and other Pacific nations. So it's a new satellite aiming to offer service in the, in the region. So there's three main technologies, I guess, cables, satellites and microwave, uh, but this talk is going to focus on the undersea cables. So the undersea cables, so why would they be of interest? Why do I want to focus on the undersea cables? I think uh, I, I've thought of three reasons. Uh, one is because there's been quite a lot of activity in the last few years in terms of the amount of cables that have been laid and also there's prospective cables in the next couple of years in the Pacific. So that creates interest for me. In a recent article in The Diplomat, the authors said that just four Pacific Island nations and territories were connected to an undersea internet cable in 2007, just four in 2007, uh, but they've predicted, and I think they're probably on the ball in that, uh, nearly all of the Pacific Island nations or territories will be connected to an undersea internet cable within the next couple of years, if they're not already. Uh, the other thing is that many of the cables have been funded as aid projects, funded by donors. And so that, uh, to me, is of interest. It raises questions, perhaps, about aid effectiveness, um, aid strategies, how are donors deciding where they're going to uh, put these different cables. And, of course, there are potential geopolitical or cybersecurity implications. Um, finally, I also thought it is worth exploring the promises made and whether these hopes are lived up to. Uh, and so those are some of the reasons why I really wanted to share with you today about undersea cables as an interesting example of what's going on in this technology space. So before uh, getting into the promises though, let's talk about the actual cables. Uh, and I have this map. If anyone hasn't got the map yet, we'll just uh, give, you, give you a map. Everyone got it? Anyone still needs a map? Oh, great. <laughs> um, so this map has been designed by Carto GIS, thanks, which is an ANU service that us researchers like to use, uh, and based on information that I gave them. It shows international cables, so I don't show the domestic cables. For instance, the domestic cables in Papua New Guinea, French Polynesia, Federated States of Micronesia, and so on. So the map just shows the international cables. Uh, and yeah, it also doesn't show cables that crisscross the Pacific but don't go to Pacific Island nations. So for instance, if a cable goes from Singapore to Sydney or Japan to Sydney or Sydney to California or something like that, I've left it off the map in order to make it clearer about what is actually happening regarding Pacific Island countries and territories. Um, so yeah, oh, and the dotted lines are not yet laid. So if you see a dotted line, that means it's either proposed or at some sort of stage of being laid, perhaps. So likely the most well-known of the undersea internet cables in the Pacific to you is the Coral Sea Cable System. Uh, this was funded by Australia and it goes from Sydney in Australia to Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea, and it also goes to Honiara, the capital of Solomon Islands, and the Coral Sea Cable System also includes that domestic cable uh, between different coastal and island parts of Solomon Islands. 
Um, it's worth mentioning that Port Moresby did have an earlier cable going from Port Moresby to Sydney, uh, which was recently decommissioned now that the Coral Sea cable is online and in operation. That earlier cable was laid in 2006. In terms of Solomon Islands, up until now, Solomon Islands only had satellite access to internet. Uh, and so this, this cable, the Coral Sea cable system, was predicted in one thing I read to increase the internet capacity in the Solomon Islands to oh, by 6,000 times relative to their estimated uh, satellite usage in terms of internet in 2019 in Solomons. Now, while in the Papua New Guinea area, I'll just talk a bit more about Papua New Guinea. Um, it's worth mentioning PPC-1, which on your Kato GIS map is uh, turquoise in colour. Um, on the screen, it's a blue line. It goes from Guam to Medang in Papua New Guinea on the north coast to Sydney. So PPC-1 was connected in 2009, Guam, Medang, Sydney. And it's worth mentioning that Guam has a lot of connections to the United States and other places, which are also not shown on this map because it would be too confusing and busy. But just suffice to say that anyone that has a, a cable going to Guam can get some use out of that because Guam has connections on to elsewhere. The Kumul cable is also shown on this map. That's a domestic cable within Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's not on your printed map because it's a domestic cable, but on the screen it's the um, sort of ready orange cable going between the different coastal ports and islands. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's just been laid basically, and it also connects to Medang and Port Moresby, which is where those international connections are. Uh, the Kumul cable has been funded by China through a loan from the Exim Bank and it's been laid by Huawei Marine. The Kumul cable also is going to include an international connection to Jayapura and that's from uh, Venemo to Jayapura just over the border in West Papua. Uh, and that is um, probably should be a dotted line on your map, uh, although it's a bit small to fit it in. Uh, and it hasn't been laid yet because of delays due to COVID-19. In terms of the technology, the recently decommissioned cable between Moresby and Sydney had 1.12 gigabytes per second. Um, that's the amount of data that could flow through the cable, 1.12 gigabytes per second. The PPC-1 cable, which is that cable that goes from Guam to Medang to Sydney and was launched in 2009, it has 10 gigabytes per second in terms of its capacity, and the Coral Sea cable project should have uh, 100 gigabytes per second, so substantially increased capacity. While in Melanesia, I'll just mention ICN-1, which on your map is a purple line. It's Vanuatu's first and only international undersea internet cable linking Port Vila in Vanuatu to Suva in Fiji. It was completed in 2014. It's worth noting that in 2018, the Vanuatu government asked Australia for support for another cable, uh, although that hasn't been forthcoming as I understand it. Another major recent cable funded by AID was the Manatua 1 Polynesia cable. It's lime green on your printed map and it connects Apia in Samoa with Nui, two places in Cook Islands, two landing stations in French Polynesia. And it was funded by New Zealand uh, with the Asian Development Bank and the Pacific Island recipient governments. It goes to some countries that never had any cables up till now. Uh, it's very recently laid, and French Polynesia already had an undersea cable, but now obviously has this one as well. So while in the Samoa area, there's the Tui Samoa, which is maroon on your printed map, uh, and um, it's Fiji to Samoa, with stops in Wallace and Fortuna. That's the territory of Wallace and Fortuna Islands, which is a French island collectivity. Uh, then we have the Samoa, American Samoa, which is a white line on your map. On your map, on your printout, it looks like a bit of a loop. It's not supposed to be loopy, it's just to fit it on the map. <laughs> Should just be a line, <laughs> straight line. Anyway, there's also the Tonga uh, cable, which is black on your printout. That's Tonga to Fiji. 
So the, it's worth noting too that in Tonga, the cable uh, went down in 2019 for about two weeks and there was basically no internet access in Tonga for a fortnight. Uh, and um, at the same time as it happens, their domestic cable also had a fault, so they were really having difficulties at that time. Turning to cables between Australia and elsewhere, the Gondwana cable is orange on your printout and it's a cable between Numea and Sydney. Uh, in New Caledonia, there is also a domestic cable, the PICO one, which connects three places within New Caledonia. Uh, and also, uh, I also have a dotted line, which is an incomplete cable between Numea and Fiji, um, which is in progress or plan. Um, and it will also include a few domestic landing stations in New Caledonia as well. Southern Cross is on your map in light blue, and it's Sydney to Suva and then on to Hawaii. It's worth noting that Hawaii has a lot of connections to the USA and elsewhere too. Again, I've left them off the map so it's not too cluttered, but um, obviously a connection to Hawaii is, is a useful connection to have. Then there's Southern Cross Next, which is a light blue dotted line on your printout. Uh, and this is going to be including Tokelau and Kiribati. Uh, it will be connected to Fiji by the end of 2022, is the prediction, uh, and it will have eight cable landing stations. Sydney, New Zealand, two in Fiji, Apia, Samoa. Um, now, Apia is not on this map, but it is uh, an option that I've seen written in some places regarding the Southern Cross next. So I'm not sure actually whether Arthur is going to be included or not, uh, but it is mentioned as an option on some of the paperwork. Uh, Talk aloud here of us and then on to the USA. While still on cables between and to and from Australia, there's the Hawaii cable, which is red on your paper. It's from Sydney to American Samoa to Hawaii. Um, then there's a grey dotted line coming out of Timor-Leste. I don't know where that's going to land yet because uh, the route hasn't been made public yet, um, but Timor-Leste has no cable at present, uh, and the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific has financed the scoping of cable design options and route options. So the destination is not clear, uh, but I did put a little dotted line there in anticipation of something happening. Turning to French Polynesia, there's the Honotua cable, which is brown on your map. That's French Polynesia to Hawaii, and it has five beach manholes or uh, submarine cable landing stations in French Polynesia, not just one. It's also worth mentioning that French Polynesia has the Nati Tua project, which connects 20 islands. It's not included in my map because it's domestic, but the Nati Tua project includes cables connecting Tahiti and 10 islands, and then a microwave radio signal is transmitted to islands further away to connect an additional 10 islands to the internet. In the Micronesia region, the Hanfru One is a pink cable on your map. It connects two places in Marshall Islands and uh, to Pohnpei in the Federated States of Micronesia and on to Guam. As I mentioned earlier, Guam is a good place to connect to because it has lots of connections to the USA and elsewhere similar to Hawaii. There is also, by the way, a domestic cable between Chuk and Pohnpei, which is not shown on my map because it's domestic. Um, Yap, uh, Yap Island in Federated States of Micronesia has a cable going to Guam, that's royal blue on your map. And then Palau has the light yellow cables. Um, Palau is already connected to one cable that goes on to the USA and um, there's a dotted line because a second cable has been announced but not completed. That second cable is to be jointly funded by Australia, Japan and the USA, so it's a trilateral one uh, for Palau. And it will connect to, uh, to the USA, as I said. East Micronesia is a light blue uh, line, a dotted incomplete line on your map. This cable system will connect Pompeii with Kosrai, Kiribati and Nauru by mid-2021. Uh, as I mentioned, there are also domestic cables in FSM, uh, so yeah, that's why um, Chuk is not shown there because it doesn't have an international cable. Of the four states of the Federated States of Micronesia, it's the only one, but it has a cable to uh, Pompeii, as I mentioned. 
Uh, there's the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, which has two cables to Guam. They're an orangey red colour on your map. In 2015, the Northern Mariana's sole cable at the time uh, snapped, as I understand, leaving no connectivity at all. Uh, and so in 2017, a second cable was laid, so they now have two cables. So as I said, Guam and Hawaii have a lot of connections to the United States and elsewhere. So any Pacific island that has a cable to Guam or Hawaii, uh, that's a good thing for them. Similarly with Australia and to a lesser extent with New Zealand as well. It's worth emphasising though that at this time there are Pacific island nations with no cable connections at all, uh, although they are being planned as I've mentioned. Uh, so for instance, Tokelau, Nauru and Kiribati, all three have cables planned for this year. I don't think Pitcairn Islands has a cable, uh, Tuvalu has no cable, but the World Bank uh, is looking to possibly include a cable in a project it's doing, although there's no details that I've been able to find yet. And of course, outer islands also miss out on cables in some cases, so outer islands in Vanuatu, Kiribati, places like that. Uh, and there's no cable to Norfolk Island as far as I know. All right, so I've introduced the cables. I'm going to talk about promises and hopes. What are the expected benefits of these internet cables and what are people told to expect? I'm going to use examples from some of the promises made with regard to two different countries, Papua New Guinea and Niue, uh, just as examples of the kinds of language that can be used. So regarding the Coral Sea cable system in Papua New Guinea, Papua New, Gu Papua New Guinea's then communication minister said in April 2018 when he was announcing uh, the cable that it will be 200 times faster than the existing cables and will reduce the cost of the internet. Upon completion of the cable, the Coral Sea Cable Company predicted faster, more affordable and reliable communications infrastructure for both Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. The Port Moresby Chamber of Commerce's industry, Commerce and Industries President, um, he has expressed some reservations about whether the cable would lead to reductions in prices for businesses and consumers. But even so, he said in January, this, uh, January last year now, uh, that he was expecting a marked improvement in terms of internet reliability, uh, which he said would be welcome. Writing for Business Advantage, Paul Chai wrote in the middle of last year that the Coral Sea Cable and the Kumul Submarine Cable, so that's the domestic one and the Australian funded one, are set to make the country's internet faster and cheaper. Regarding the Kumul Cable, the domestic cable, uh, which is going to coastal towns and islands, PNG Data Co CEO was quoted in May last year as saying that the Kumul Cable would allow much cheaper, faster and more efficient internet. And talking about the same cable, another official was quoted in March last year as saying that the cable would reduce internet prices. The Kumul cable, as I've mentioned, was funded by a loan from China's Exim Bank. So a Chinese councillor in Papua New Guinea said in March last year that the cable would enhance internet speed, improve quality and help to reduce internet prices. There have been many more such procl proclamations from various sources and spokespeople in Papua New Guinea and elsewhere regarding the new cables uh, to and within Papua New Guinea. This is just a flavour of some of the promises and hopes with regard to Papua New Guinea uh, and um, yeah, just an example of the kind of things that people say. Niue is another example I wanted to share with you. So it recently was connected to the Manatua cable, the New Zealand funded cable, Niue's first internet cable. And after some delays, they had a big celebratory event about a fortnight ago from which these photos uh, have been taken. Uh, and the cable was launched and became live in May this year, as I say, with much uh, enthusiasm. In a Niue government media release, the Premier of Niue said in May this year that the Manatua cable will transform the speed, capacity, resilience and affordability of internet and telecommunications for the people of Niue. The CEO of Telecom Niue said at the same time that the Manatua cable will bring faster and more affordable connectivity. So that's just a snapshot of some of the kinds of promises and hopes that are, uh, that are there regarding internet cables in the Pacific. 
I just wanted to mention and uh, explain, in case you're not aware, that the cables increase the bandwidth. It's a bit like if you have a narrow water pipe and then you have a larger water pipe with a wider diameter, then you're going to get more water through the pipe. Your, your capacity uh, is increasing. Uh, but of course, these hopes are also about internet prices, um, internet speeds, reliability, and even sometimes people will say, oh, there'll be more uptake of the internet, there'll be more use of the internet, it'll be used for a wider range of things. Well, is that necessarily true when it's simply infrastructure going in? So, um, yeah, those are some of the questions that would be great to, to delve into and monitor. So turning now to my ongoing research, overall the aim of my research is to assess whether some of the promises and hopes have been met. Um, I think that there's scope for more research, but I'm doing the uh, bit that I can, and I'm looking at mobile internet speeds and mobile internet prices. In terms of speeds, I'm doing research with Rohan Fox, who's here at ANU at the Development Policy Centre, and our study that we've been running has set out to determine whether there were any differences over time regarding mobile internet speeds. So these are the speeds experienced by users on their smartphones. Um, we went, actually both of us went to Parliament House in December in 2019 here in Canberra and attended the launch of the Coral Sea Cable. We'd already been talking about this research and we were hearing all these promises and we said let's monitor the mobile internet speeds in the first half of 2020 and see what happens regarding the Coral Sea Cable system and we included some Manitoua countries uh, as well for interest so we were focused on the first half of 2020 to see if there were any changes in mobile internet speeds during that time after the launch of the Coral Sea Cable system in particular. The research which has been submitted to a journal looks at the mobile internet speeds experienced by 15 smartphone users um, on their smartphones in different locations. Uh, it presents new quantitative data from the first Monday in January through to the end of June 2020 last year. Uh, these 15 different people used an application in their smartphones to test the speeds that their smartphone was experiencing. So as you can see in the box plot here of the download speeds experienced by our 15 uh, smartphone users, Port Moresby had considerably higher speeds than the other Pacific Island locations with an average speed approximately 70% of that in Sydney but with more variation than the Australian capital cities, um, meaning that the internet can be fast but it's less reliable, it varies. So from left to right, in case you can't read it from where you're sitting, uh, there's five locations in Papua New Guinea, there's one in rural New South Wales, Canberra, Sydney, Suva, two different research assistants using different mobile networks in Apia, Samoa, uh, two people in Honiara on different networks, a rural Solomon Islands location, and then someone in Yap in the Federated States of Micronesia. So this figure shows download speeds. We could have done a same figure, similar figure for upload speeds and ping speeds because we found that those all were matched and, and were similar. So in other words, if someone had a high, um, you know, good quality internet in terms of download speed, the upload speed would be similarly of a good quality. Um, ob obviously we realise this is not statistically sound because it's only 15 uh, research assistance, but it gives you a sense of the experiences of those 15 people in different locations using different networks. And overall the results between locations would be what you might expect with urban areas in Australia best in terms of speed and consistency. Uh, and as I said, Port Moresby had some good speeds but some variability in terms of the quality of the service. The worst performer was the only rural Pacific Island location included in the study, which was East Quayo in uh, rural Solomon Islands. So as I said, the study set out to determine whether there were any differences over time. And for the first six months of 2020, the data indicated no statistically significant change in download speeds over that six months uh, for 11 of the 15 users once variations in time of day, weather and built area were taken into account. 
Um, so for one of the remaining four users, the sale of a mobile telephone network may have negatively impacted upon the results because uh, one of our users was with Blue Sky in Samoa, which was sold to Amalgamated Telecom Holdings and became branded as Vodafone Samoa. And over the transition, the internet basically was almost not working at all for a period there. So that obviously negatively affected that user's results. Three of the users had an increase. Uh, those three people were in Suva, Bell Ranald, a rural New South Wales town, and the other user in Apia on a different network. So Suva and Bell Ranald don't have internet cables that are relevant, they were just interesting comparators. Oh, in other words, Suva doesn't, didn't have a new cable at this time, sorry. Um, but Apia did have one of the users had an increase. Um, so we thought that was interesting, but then the media reports in the second half of 2020 talked about the Manatua cable coming online, so we realised that the Manatua cable wasn't technically available um, when that person had the increase in internet speeds. So possibly there was less congestion because the other network was down, that might have meant their speeds went up, we're not really sure what happened there. Um, but certainly there was no obvious increase in internet speeds in the first half of 2020, at least among our 15 research assistants, uh, and yeah, in the first half of that year only, which is all that we've done so far in terms of crunching numbers. I want to thank Rohan, who's here on campus, and also the research assistants who are involved, of course. The other project that I have is mobile internet prices in Papua New Guinea, and I'm doing that with two PNG scholars. Uh, both of them are doing weekly checks using their mobile phones, using uh, menus, something like this menu here. Um, so this is a screenshot that one of them took for me when he was doing his recent tests. So since the start of January last year, January 2020, these two people are using USSD menus in their phones. So these menus are, for instance, you press one for data plans, or here it says press three for call plans, that kind of thing. And we're using the menus because we think that's the most up-to-date way to get data. If we were relying on newspaper advertisements or something else, then we might be behind or not up-to-date or something. Uh, so every Monday, the, um, these two people check three different the three networks that are available in Papua New Guinea. Um, and our findings so far reveal um, that there's been no perceptible decrease in mobile internet prices in Papua New Guinea uh, since the launch of the Coral Sea Cable System in 2019, December. Uh, it's worth mentioning that during 2020, we're aware there were negotiations going on between the regulator and the wholesaler and the telecommunication companies in Papua New Guinea regarding the pricing, uh, the regulated pricing of wholesale internet in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's also worth mentioning that although those prices have now been set and there's targets for, or in fact legislated requirements for decreases in wholesale internet prices for each of the next couple of years, however, the retail prices are not regulated. So they're regulating the wholesale prices that go to internet service providers, but then those internet service providers are, and mobile telecommunication companies are the ones that provide the actual service to the consumers and businesses. Um, so yeah, so I'm doing this ongoing research on speeds and prices, and uh, I do have some people in Manatua cable countries as well. Uh, and research assistants in Papua New Guinea. I would dearly love to have more though, so uh, if anyone is inspired today to think about any smartphone lovers that you have in the Pacific uh, that you're friends with or something, then I'd be willing to talk about signing up some more people. The final section of the talk is on the three key issues that I put in the title of the talk, geopolitics, cybersecurity and sustainability, and why any of this matters. Um, why are the cables worth studying, and what do they show as a case study? And I'll talk about each one of these three terms uh, one by one in this order, but of course they are interrelated. So geopolitics, um, according to a Japanese academic at a Tokyo-based think tank, in February this year, he wrote that Australia's investment in the Coral Sea cable system um, shut out Huawei, Huawei Marine, which had originally been contracted by the Solomon Islands government 
to lead the project. And that has also been reported in uh, various media that the Solomon Islands government had signed a contract which was then uh, torn up and Australia provided their cable. Um, but interestingly, Papua New Guinea used Huawei Marine uh, for their domestic cable with a Chinese loan. I have heard that Australia offered to do Papua New Guinea's domestic cable, although I haven't seen that in writing, and I have heard that Papua New Guinea said no, but I'm not sure uh, what was happening behind closed doors there. Um, also, it's worth mentioning, of course, this relates to cyber security because Huawei has been blocked from participating in Australia's national broadband network and also Australia's 5G rollout because of concerns about cyber security. So I think that raises questions about Huawei's activities potentially in the region as well. It's been suggested that undersea cables have emerged as a sensitive area of diplomacy in the Pacific given their central role in international communications. And in a Reuters exclusive report by Jonathan Barrett, he was writing about in particular the East Micronesia cable which is currently being tendered with funding from the World Bank and the ADB. And he claimed that the United States has warned Pacific Island nations about security threats posed by a Chinese company's cut price bid to build that cable. That's the East Micronesia cable, which is one of the ones on your map. Uh, and that Jonathan Barrett's article does refer to Huawei Marine. Huawei has been subjected to repeated rounds of US sanctions and allegations that its products are being used by Beijing for spying, a charge consistently denied by the Chinese company, which says on its website that it's wholly owned by its employees. Uh, so in short, China's accused of exploiting the undersea cables or planning to, uh, to spy on other countries, although they deny these charges. So following that Reuters report, Newsweek reported that Taiwan had also expressed concerns and the two writers, David Brennan and John Feng, wrote in December last year that Taiwan had claimed that China is backing private investment in Pacific undersea internet cables as a way to spy on foreign nations and steal their data. And the article includes a quote from a named foreign ministry spokesperson, and I'm happy to provide the links if you want to read more. Indeed, I was interested to learn that at least three cables have been cancelled since Hong Kong's extradition laws changed. Uh, so presumably due to concerns about China stealing data or having, having access to the infrastructure. Uh, so the Hong Kong Americas cable was one that was planned since 2018 by Facebook and others and it was to include two sites in California and go to Hong Kong and Taiwan. It's been shelved, it was shelved in March this year. The Pacific Light cable first proposed in 2017 by Facebook and Google was to be between the US and Hong Kong, but uh, the pro proposal has now been revised with links to Taiwan and the Philippines and not Hong Kong. Uh, and also the Beta Bay Express, which was first planned since 2018. It was to include a consortium of companies, but the plans were withdrawn last year. It was going to link Hong Kong, Singapore and the US and possibly Malaysia. So that's at least three cables that I know of um, that were canned or had routes changed um, since the Hong Kong laws changed, obviously because of those kind of concerns. So cybersecurity is uh, all through what I was just talking about really regarding geopolitics, um, and, but specifically on cybersecurity and writing on findings from discussions with 107 Pacific security practitioners, Jay Caldwell wrote, cybersecurity was regularly raised in consultations with these 107 Pacific security practitioners, but the capacity needs in the area were unclear. He goes on to say that the cables the recent ones that have been laid and the ones that are coming up are a major driver of cyber risk perception. Another three writers, Rudolph, Kreese and Sharma, have also argued that the new cables had increased the risks of Pacific Island nations becoming victims of cyber attacks and cyber crime. This image is the cover of a report by Bart Hogaveen of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who's sitting over there with a pile of reports if anyone wants extra copies. <laughs> uh, and this report includes profiles of six nations, including their cyber preparedness. 
Um, Bart has explained to me that it's important to think not just about technical capacity though, in terms of how countries are ready or not ready to respond to attacks, but he also points out the importance of the capacity of people. Does uh, the Pacific Island nation have the required IT skills? Do the policy makers understand the cybersecurity issues? Are the right knowledge and skill levels available within the countries? Uh, Bart's also pointed out to me that online safety is quite uh, closely linked to cyber security and I know there have been a couple of online safety initiatives within the Pacific region this year and obviously that's an important issue. Economic security is also tied in with cyber security so if there's a threat to a business or a utility company that relies on the internet for instance um, so these kind of threats can be real. So for instance when Tonga's cable went down in 2019, as I mentioned. Uh, Bart was explaining to me that he understands that this is why they now have Pacific putting in satellite dishes all over Tonga as a backup in case, uh, so they're not left in the same spot when the cable goes down next time if it does. Uh, so these are some of Bart's points really, but he's available here uh, if you want to meet him after my talk. So thanks for coming along, Bart, and thanks for all our helpful conversations. Um, and one issue upon which uh, there's agreement with Bart anyway is Rudolf, Kreis and Sharma who've also argued on this capacity issue. They say that one main issue in the Pacific is the lack of qualified people when it comes to cyber security. The other point that I had put in the heading of the talk is sustainability. There are various potential risks to the robustness and uh, ongoing effectiveness of the cables themselves, the technical matters, uh, but also to the uh, potential benefits that might be expected to come from the cables. So for instance, natural disasters, uh, obviously with climate change increasing the frequency and severity of natural disasters, there's a risk that cables could be snapped or disturbed. Uh, earthquakes can also damage cables, of course. Then there's regulatory issues, and I know that I've mentioned the PNG wholesale pricing stoush last year. There's also been regulatory issues in Solomons and other countries that potentially limit the uh, effectiveness or benefits that could come from this infrastructure. Financial issues, so for instance in Papua New Guinea the wholesaler is PNG Data Co, and the CEO of that organisation said in a recent webinar that they uh, that he's really trying to shuffle around money to work out how to pay the suppliers. So he's really struggling to try and work out how to meet the bills. So that's another challenge. And also this issue of uh, monopolies. We know that in a, quite a lot of Pacific Island countries there's only one telecommunication company, for instance in the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, and this is also potentially an issue at the submarine cable landing stations as I've mentioned, because there's different models for how companies might or might not be able to access the cable landing stations themselves. Uh, so I'll hand back to Judy now. Thank you very much.